It's often said, and rarely challenged, that one of the great achievements of the European Union was peace in Western Europe after the Second World War. I don't believe that to be true. The peace that has existed in Western Europe after the Second World War actually owes more to the Soviet Union than it does to the European Union. It was inconceivable that for 50 years, almost 50 years, after the end of the Second World War, when Western Europe faced an existential threat from the ambitions of the Soviet Union, that any further fighting should take place in the western part of the continent. They were obliged to unite to face that threat. That was the reason we had peace in Western Europe for, for 50 years after the Second World War. And of course, happily, after, the, uh, after that period had, uh, had uh, lasted and the Soviet Union had disintegrated, <coughs> happily, the countries of Western Europe had got out of the habit of fighting each other uh, and we have been able to enjoy peace uh, ever, ever since. Right Honourable and learned friend, seriously think that the only reason for Franco-German reconciliation after the war, which is at the heart of European peace, at the heart of building a new Europe out of the moral, economic and political rubble, does he seriously think that the only reason for that was a Soviet threat? It might have contributed, but there were far bigger political issues which produced that. Thank heavens for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. We, can, we can argue about whether it was the only reason or not, and of course there were other factors which encouraged Franco-German reconciliation. But the peace of the western half of the continent was an inevitable consequence of the threat which that, those countries faced from the Soviet Union to the east. Yes, of course. This is a very interesting historical debate, uh, but I would like to add to it the point uh, that actually uh, one of the reasons why Franco-German reconciliation occurred was because of the construction of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, in which Britain, uh, through its post-war, in the post-war Labour government and particularly uh, its Foreign Secretary Ernie Bevin, played an absolutely central role, and it's because of the, uh, the, the fact that the Federal Republic of Germany has been one of the most successful states in Europe since the Second World War, that the reconciliation has proved possible, and, uh, and this has been an essential underpinning of yeah. European yeah. Union yeah. and peace. Yeah. I can go a long way uh, towards agreeing with the, uh, with the, with the noble lord. Um, that's a, a somewhat different matter from the role of the European Union. But I, I want to... I want to... What about the bell? Most, most grateful, my little friend, but following on from what the noble Lord, Lord Bizzle just said, would my noble friend not agree that we would not have had a peaceful Europe without a strong, stable Europe? And fundamental to creating that stability was the iron and steel community out of which the European common market, as it was originally called, came. And I believe it was a profound mistake, which a very great British Prime Minister tried to put right, that we were not in much earlier. But my noble friend cannot just say that it was the Soviet threat that created a strong, stable Europe, because that is manifestly untrue. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, with respect to, uh, to my noble friend, I didn't, no, I didn't say that. I said, and I repeat what I said, no, no, I'm going to repeat what I said before I give way again. I said that peace in Western Europe after the Second World War owed more to the Soviet Union than it did to the European Union. I didn't say that the Soviet Union's threat was the only factor. Of course, there were other factors. Many of the things which have been said in questions to me in the last few minutes have, uh, have considerable truth in them. But it's ridiculous to ignore the extent to which peace in Western Europe was a consequence of the existential threat which the Western part of the continent faced from the Soviet Union to the East. Now, I would like to, uh, I'd like to proceed to consider the bill, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, get... I, I, I don't intend to prolong this historical debate other than to say to the noble lord that I think he's falling into the trap that one of the earlier speakers in this debate warned us about. That is to say, he's being too Manichaean. 
uh, he is juxtaposing the Soviet Union threat uh, against the NATO response uh, and the European Union. It's all of them together, and it's because they are all working together to common aims that we have managed to come through better. And when it war broke out in Europe again in the 1990s in the Balkans, the longer-term response to that has mainly come from the European Union. So surely we can just go move away from this, uh, I think, distorted view of history and accept that the European Union has played an integral part in our security and prosperity, but not the only part. I don't disagree with, uh, with the noble lord, uh, and I think his intervention establishes that we've made some progress, because in common parlance, it is very frequently the case that the European Union is given the entire credit for creating peace in Western Europe after the Second World War, and I don't believe that to be true. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to move on to consider. I'd like to move now. I'd like to move on to consider the bill. No, I'm afraid I'm not going to give way on this anymore. I want to, I want to move on to consider the bill which is before your lordship's house today, and it's this bill on which we ought to be focusing our attention. Uh, now, the. Um, the noble Lord, Lord Hennessy, whom, uh, whom we all admire so much uh, and for whom we have so much affection, has recently propounded a novel theory of government. He's given it a name. Uh, he calls it the government of good chaps. Um, I, he is obviously in a much better position to explain <laughs> his theory than I am. Uh, but as I understand it, one of, the, one of the elements in his theory is that the constituent parts of government and uh, our written, unwritten constitution should uh, behave within their respective roles as understood by convention and tradition under those unwritten rules. And it's uh, my contention before your lordships this morning that the legislation before the House is a fundamental breach of the good chap theory of government. Uh, and I shall endeavour to explain why I have reached that conclusion. Uh, our unwritten constitution is based on the separation of powers. In particular, the separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. It's the role of the executive to govern. It's the role of the legislature to hold the executive to account to hold to account, but not itself to govern. This bill represents an attempt by the legislature to assume the mantle of government. That is why it's wrong, uh, that is why it's illegitimate, uh, that is why it constitutes a fundamental breach of the good chap theory of government. That, that's why it's in breach of the conventions of our unwritten constitution. These observations would apply regardless of the underlying situation, the underlying reason, uh, which gives rise to the bill before your Lordship's House. But of course, the fact that the underlying reason uh, un underpinning the bill relates to Brexit makes it even worse. Let me take your Lordship's back. Oh, to the, to the, uh, of course I give that. I'm very grateful yeah. to the noble lord. If the only rule, role of parliament was to hold the government to account, how does he explain the fact that we pass laws? Initiate we pass laws which bind the government. We very often amend bills that the government introduces in a way that the government doesn't want. So we do more than hold the government to account. We actually set the way in which the law of this country and the government acts. Well, Parliament passes laws initiated by government, uh, and par Parliament, does, when it passes those laws, uh, and indeed amends those laws, it, it does not enter into the detailed prescription of government which is contained in this bill. That is why this bill and its predecessor early in the year represent so fundamental a breach of precedent. Uh, they, were only, they were only facilitated by the fact 
that the, uh, the speaker in the other place decided to uh, dispense with precedent and, as far as we are aware, dispense with the advice which he was given and, and to allow the, uh, the opposition to take charge of the business of the House. I want to take the House back to the second reading of the referendum bill in the other place, the bill which provided for the referendum. That second reading debate was introduced by the then Foreign Secretary. The then Foreign Secretary was one Philip Hammond. This is what he said. Whether you favour Britain being in or out, we should surely all be able to agree on the simple principle that the decision over our membership should be taken by the British people, not by Whitehall bureaucrats, certainly not by Brussels bureaucrats, not even by government ministers or parliamentarians in this chamber, or parliamentarians in this chamber. The decision, he said, should be for the common sense of the British people. This bill delivers the simple referendum, in-out referendum, that we promised. The bill um, which provided for that referendum was, of course, passed by a very large majority. But the difficulty, if I can just finish my sentence, the difficulty that we faced ever since is that the British people delivered a result in that referendum which Parliament neither expected nor wanted. Uh, I'm happy to give way to the noble lord. Well, I don't want to, to take up much time, but I think it, it's very clear that if we had the decision again, we would not take a referendum. Lord uh, is, is entitled to his view. I'm not sure that I, uh, I agree with it. I, I would not agree with it. So this is the root cause of the difficulties which we have faced over the last three years. Parliament took a different view. Parliament got the result from the British people. Certainly the then Foreign Secretary who moved the second reading of the bill got a result from the British people, very different from the result that he wanted or expected. Um, and Parliament has, I regret to say, sought to thwart at every turn the interpretation, uh, the implementation of that decision of the British people. And this bill is but the latest instalment of that said sad uh, endeavour. It, uh, it of course gets us nowhere. We've had one extension as a result of the bill's predecessor. It's given six months of extra time. It's resulted in no conclusion. And the failure of the noble Baroness, uh, Baroness Ludford to answer the question posed by the noble Lord, Lord Graycott, uh, was eloquent in its admission that those who came together to support the bill before your Lordships, both in the other place and in this House, uh, are not in any sense in agreement about the next steps and about what ought to be done. Now, this situation is made even more serious by the refusal of those who proclaim their belief in democracy to put that belief into practice. It's, uh, it's bad enough that Parliament thinks it knows better than the British people on this issue. It's even worse that Parliament, as things stand at the moment, is denying the British people a general election in which they would have the right to decide, in which they would have the right to express their view on the performance of the malfunctioning of the other place, and they would have the right to insist on the implementation of the decision they took in 2016. This bill is, I hope, one of the final acts of a House of Commons which has proved itself manifestly incapable of meeting the challenges in front of it. I urge your Lordships to reject it.